Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethel. Welcome to our morning worship service. And as we come into the presence of God, let us come to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in prayer to ask you that you would prepare our hearts for worship, that, our, that you would open up our understanding, that the words would be spoken, may fall on good ground, that your words would be a light to our path, that we would know how to live as your chosen people. Be with us as we come to worship you, for we pray all these things in the Lord Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we come and gather into the house of the Lord to worship God, let us come with a sense of motive, a heart of praise to the Lord. The Apostle Peter writes these words recorded for us in the Bible, and he writes to the first century Christians in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and he writes, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. May we, may we have these as our personal reasons to come and praise the Lord. And Apostle Peter shares that we have been called, called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light to be God's chosen and special people. Our first hymn this morning, Heaven Came Down, hymn 495, is a hymn that sings and describes life without the Lord Jesus as wandering in darkness, but salvation in the Lord Jesus changes that, that from the darkness he sheds light in our lives and when God chose us to be his people, we ought to respond appropriately to his calling that we should take the offer offered to us to be part of God's family. Well, let us be glad that it is not of our works that would gain us salvation, but it is really God's abundant grace and our faith in the Lord Jesus that would enable us to enter into this great work called salvation. This morning, God is most worthy to be worshipped because he has done a wonderful work called salvation through the Lord Jesus. Well, let us begin our worship by singing this wonderful hymn, Heaven Came Down. Let us sing. We thank you for singing that wonderful hymn. Last week's Sunday message was a good reminder that, that the Lord chose us as his people. And we ought to respond to the Lord by abiding in the Lord Jesus and his words. That it is not us that chose the Lord, but it was the other way around that the Lord chose us to be his special people. The Apostle John records for us these words spoken by the Lord himself, and it's found in John 15, verse 9 to 11. And the Lord Jesus said these words, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. The Lord Jesus mentioned the fruit of love and joy 
in the words which he spoke to his followers. And for us, his future followers, we ought to keep and abide in the words of the, that was spoken by the Lord Jesus. May we learn to keep and abide in the Lord Jesus and his words that we may bear much fruit, that God may be glorified. He hideth my soul is our next hymn. And this hymn is a hymn that blesses the name of the Lord Jesus as our wonderful Savior. And when I revisited the message from last week and how the Lord Jesus chose us and appointed us for, for the purpose to bear fruit for the Lord, it helped me to rediscover all over again that God desires to abide, desires us to abide in the Lord Jesus, to bear fruit that God be glorified and that we would be recognized as the Lord's disciples. For having said these things, let us take up this second hymn together, He Hideth My Soul, hymn 496. Thank you for singing that second hymn of ours. You know, ever since Bethel's family camp ended, a natural response for me was really to, to, to take up memorizing the Lord's word written in the Bible. And as a younger person, in fact, as a teenager, I did this, I set myself the task of trying to memorize Bible verses. But the enthusiasm shortly diminished and memorizing Bible verses shortly became a chore. So I discontinued memorizing God's word. But after church camp of this year, it has been a requirement that I must fulfill as a member of God's people to really start to keep the Lord's words in my heart. And I have found that memorizing the Lord's word is actually the easy part. What I find more challenging is living by what is memorized in the Bible. What is memorized from his words, the Bible, reveals to me the kind of person God is. And the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the humble in heart and those who tremble at his words. You know, Isaiah 66, verse 1 to 2, the Lord says these words. Thus the Lord says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. God desires to dwell among his people. And he says that he is near to the humble-hearted and those who fear, fears and regards his words. May God reveal his words to us that he may enable us to shed the light of his words upon our understanding. Our next hymn is Sunshine in My Soul, hymn 499. As sunshine gives light and life to the earth and all living things, may the words of the Lord enable us to grow and bear much fruit for the glory of God, that through abiding and hiding his words in our hearts, may we learn more faithful truths from God that we worship. Well, let us please um, stand as we take up our last hymn before the message, Sunshine in My Soul. I'll pass this time to Pastor Chris. We're going to uh, take up the Bible memory verse. That is really a wonderful text if we can understand it. Okay. 
Now, 1 Corinthians 1.27, let's, let's recite it, then I'll explain what this text means. Okay, well, let's try this together, 1 Corinthians 1.27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. This tells us how God chooses. What does it mean? Okay, what it doesn't mean is God, God chooses stupid people. Okay, you're foolish, right? God will surely choose you. It's automatic. You know, if you're weak, you're sick, you're dying, God will choose you. Uh, does it mean that? The answer is no. Okay, but what does it mean? Okay, you got to read Paul. Sometimes he uses contrast. Okay, the contrast is wise, the mighty of this world. In other words, compared with God's wisdom and might. Now, this is the idea here of the wise, secular wisdom. The wisdom of the world, right? Not of God's. Now, we're looking at might as in, you know, natural human strength. That kind. So God has chosen supposedly those who don't have all these things. They're not your, your boys, they don't go to, they didn't graduate from, all, you know, all those things that people pride of, oh, this person is wise in the secular sense. Or strong in the human sense. They're not outstanding to you. But God can choose a pretty ordinary person and put his wisdom in them, and put his strength in them, and it will put to shame the rest. That is what this text means. There's your difference. Compare human wisdom with God's wisdom. Nothing to compare. You can't even compare. Compare human strength with divine power. There's nothing to compare. You see the idea of God has chosen here? And he, what does he do? He puts strength. He puts wisdom in the person he has chosen. And it will stand out. Not human strength. Certainly not human wisdom. Okay? Just so we can not just memorize the Lord's word, but understand it too. Okay, and we're going to pray together where we talk about not human strength alone, is we're going to pray for each other, those who are unwell especially. We thank God for the strength he gives to us. You talk to those who are caring for you know, Auntie Allison, Auntie Chris, Uncle Kam, Uncle Willie. No, the family. And here they are caring for mom and she's on palliative care. Every day is like the last day. And it is, and I already said, you know, it's a lot of, you're going to have a lot of strength you need a lot. It's going to take a lot. And they said, we understand. We're going to do it. That's my mom. Then I appreciate that. So we say to all the rest, and you know, getting the young ad adults to mop the floors on Saturdays, you know, like other people taking over. But of course, to support the family in whatever ways we can. But this thing we can't give you, divine strength. And this is, can be yours. God's strength in you to care for people, to care for mom. And this is going to be my prayer for you, for the family who are here this morning. For Auntie Lillian, divine strength. For Auntie Mary, divine strength. It's part of being chosen and you are among the chosen. And this is available to you. This is why we can say, Lord, thank you so much. And we're going to pray for each other. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you would give to us your power, your wisdom, because we are among the chosen of yours. Thank you for those who are committed to their faith in you. And even though it is hard, and even though it is tiring and challenging, and it, often frustration can come, yet they have not set aside their faith. They will continue to worship. We pray for our brethren, 
upon the Chris, Auntie Allison, Uncle Cam, and their, their family, Uncle Willie as well, all who are caring. The children who are not even, you know, who are not worshipping here, but they are caring for the mom, for mom. And we ask that strength will be given to this family at this point in time. We rejoice in the fact that Madam Tung, her faith is in the Lord, and she looks forward to being with the Lord. That we think of the family and how they are caring for her, and we pray that you would strengthen them. We think of Auntie Mary with her bout of illness this week with internal bleeding. We ask for grace and strength to be given to her as she's not 100% well. For Auntie Lillian to go to hospital later, may she find renewed strength and hope in her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, even as she goes for a procedure. May your word encourage her heart to hold fast and to all who are here battling our own struggles and challenges, whether with illness or with problems in life. It is so good to know that you give wisdom and power to those who are yours. And so we ask that you would encourage our hearts with your word once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to turn to two texts on this whole subject of chosen. Now, I'm going to do a bit of review. Okay, last week's message on John 15. Okay, because it is connected with this morning's message. Okay, after last week's message, there were questions that came in. How, how do I really understand what it means to abide in Jesus? Can, can I like, share with you it? How Jesus taught it is the best already. He sums it up with one word, abide. You know what John 15 is about? John 15 is about salvation. How do you know a person is truly chosen, saved by God? The person will abide. There will be fruits. Take a look at John 15. Okay, now John 15, chosen salvation. Then later on, later on, we will read the gospel and the book of Acts and look at chosen with reference to serving God. You need the both. First, salvation, then service. Okay, now take a look at John 15 and Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, now look at this, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, and it will bear more fruit. Now, right? Now, verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, I in him, bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, one, there's no fruit, two, does not abide, he is cast out, as a branch, withered, gathered them, throw into the fire, and they are burned. This is a reference to the final judgment. And so if a person ought to check whether I really am a branch, whether really I have, I say I have faith in Jesus, but am I a branch connected to Jesus? If I am not remaining, if I don't display any fruit in my life of salvation, it doesn't stay in me, then these words will apply to you in the final day of judgment. You are taken out and cast out. Burn. I mean, if I read these words and understand what Jesus is saying, I should, okay, am I, please, I, I would look for the fruits. I would check very, very carefully. I would never don't want to take this one for granted. Right? It is for us to check because it can look like a branch and not a branch. If this branch is not remaining, there is, no, if this person is truly saved, this person is truly chosen, salvation is there. Watch, there will be some fruits. Right? As they remain in their faith, look, take a look at what Jesus said. Okay, in verse 6, 
By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You see a true disciple of Jesus, they bear much fruit. As they follow Jesus, as they learn from Him, they remain in His Word, they remain in His love, it comes out through their life. Now, if there is zero fruit, as in like zero, right? There is the person, God's Word does not remain in the heart and the mind. There's no love for the Lord. There is no love for His people. There is no love for the work of God. Then this is going to be a very solemn word for you. But of course, right? We would look at it and say, wow, this is serious. Of course it is serious. He didn't use those words because he's not serious. Can you see the imagery here? So salvation is not something that we want to take a risk on. It would be absurd, right? We don't take risks on lots of things. Well, whether we got our life in order, we got our insurance, we got everything properly, everything covered except our salvation. During the week, I, I, I told Aldine I saw a very terrible car accident on my street. I drove out, right, this street, and then just to go somewhere, and then I came back. When I came back, roadblock. The car that was driving on the street was smashed so badly, it was on its side, ambulance all over. And I told Aldine, that could have been me. Or it was me. You can't predict anything. You know, you can happen. It's just a, it was a sobering thought because I drove down that road, nothing. Within a few minutes, come back, roadblock. What happened? So bad, I have to take a detour somewhere else. And a car has gone on its side, and the other one is smashed in. And I just said to Eldin, I hope it's not a fatality, because there's ambulance everywhere. Are you sure you're saved? Are you sure as you stand before God, He is not going to... Are you a branch? Where are the fruits? Where is the remaining? Where is the abiding? It's so clear. Abide in me and I in you. Unless, if not, this so-called branch is cast out. Right? So to the disciple, they, they, they see the fruits, they must be encouraged. Is there salvation? Then look for the fruits. You know these, you are my true disciples. Do you stop there? The answer is no. I want to bear fruit for the Lord. I will seek the Lord. I will let His word remain in my heart, in my mind. This is the, what is salvation? Well, by their fruits you can tell. You see this? So this is the crux of John 15. I thought you want to, because there were questions, what does it mean to abide? Well, this is what it is. The thrust of it is actually salvation. Okay. And so it is important. This is why we began last Sunday or the first, uh, or the first uh, of this month is because we're looking at the New Testament now. We're looking at the salvation now. You begin with chosen salvation, saved. Right? Now, today, this morning, we are going to look at chosen for service. And they're related. The disciples were called and chosen and they were trained to become servants of God one day. That is an awesome privilege. But first, you've got to be saved. He may not even save, no fruit, no branch, nothing. You're not even a disciple. But if you are, for this morning, there is some fruits. There is a desire to bear fruit. There is a desire to serve God. Wow, this word is for you. Right? How can I really be a fruitful servant of God? Well, this word is really for you. Okay, well, take a look at this. Are we going to turn a little bit to, um, okay, uh, to take a look at how Jesus first called his disciples. So let's trace a little bit before we go to the book of Acts. Now, I'll explain to you what this is, okay? Right? First is Matthew, the famous passage in Matthew 4. 
how Jesus called his disciples to follow him. Right? And then we read in verse 19, 18, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee. He was not sightseeing, right? He, he knows this place. He didn't go down there, okay, let's look at the market. Let's see what fish I can buy today. No. With great intention and great purpose, he saw the two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting net, and they were fishermen. And said to them, look, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their debts and followed him. You begin with the call, right? They got called and invited to follow the Lord Jesus. His mind is to train them, right? So along the way, Jesus calls others. He calls James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, verse 21, and then same response, they left their nets, they left their father's boat, and they followed him. So this was the starting point. Right? Jesus was committed to the disciples, he trained them. Now, this is important because the, the apostles will become a pattern for us today. You will become literally an example of how servants of God are trained. We begin with the call to discipleship. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you want, do you want to learn? Do you want to follow Jesus? No, you want to serve God? Please step aside. You're not serving. Of course. Okay? So when I have a car park ministry, it's not about control. It's about do you want to be a disciple? I'm not asking for volunteers. I'm asking to be, I'm going to choose. So please don't choose yourself, right? So I've already told you, this is what I'm looking for. If you volunteer yourself, means, wow, you fit the criteria. Did you read last week's bulletin? Did you read this week's bulletin? Then you will know what is in my, what, why we, how are we chose, choosing these things here? You wouldn't dare to volunteer yourself. Chosen. They did not volunteer themselves. They didn't say, hi, Jesus, can we follow you? Oh, no, they didn't. They were chosen. Called chosen. Fishermen. Along the way, a tax collector was called and chosen too. Matthew 9. Now, Matthew 10 is important. Matthew 10 is when we see how Jesus called 12. Right? There were many of them called Disciples, many, many followed Jesus. Many heard him spoke on the Sermon of the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. A whole group of them would be there. Out of the mass of disciples following Jesus, he chose 12. Now, take a look at this. And when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits, to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles. Do you see the shift here? Apo uh, disciple. Now, commission. Apostle. So the healing, the power that is given by the Lord is certainly not from them. This was a special taste of the ministry of the apostles one day. It's called a taste of what you can and will do. And so they were sent, as we read a whole list of names here, uh, you know, uh, Peter and, and the rest of them, the 12. And then now we call them these 12. 12 disciples, apostle, these 12, right? Jesus, verse 5 we read this, send them out commanding, right? Give them instructions, okay? Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Don't go there. Don't go, to, uh, rather, the lost sheep of Israel. So very limited. This is like, this is not the final sent out. This is called your test. This is an experience. So it's a very limited ministry. You, they were to experience and learn lots of things. One. They will learn vital lessons of faith. They were to 
call upon their faith. They've got to learn to depend, right, on their faith. Don't bring extra money back. Don't bring the cloak. You're going to depend on your faith. God will provide. You know, you can't learn these things in theory. You do not learn about prayer, about faith, sitting, reading a book. It's going to be in actual life and ministry. Right? And so they will learn to share the gospel, right? Preach, which is written here. They will go around town to town um, and, and preaching the kingdom of God as Jesus did. Experience preaching. They will have to learn. There will be resistance. People will reject you. You, know, you need to learn how to take rejection too. You, they will experience oppositions. See, these were the things now as an apostle they were to experience and learn. Now, take a look at this in verse 20. Now, this is really going to be a challenging thing, a special thing, but they've got to learn to depend on the Spirit of God to speak in and through them. Take a look at verse 20. And verse 19, first, they will deliver you up, right? Don't worry. What about how or what you should speak? For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not for you to speak, uh, it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks to you. Now, you only understand this text if you are a speaker. If you are a preacher, if you're a teacher, uh, then you really appreciate this. Because one of our greatest challenges as teachers of God's word is how to speak what to speak. We already have content. We know the Lord has already taught them, hey, these are the content. Well, about five to seven, rich content, rich truth. But I have half an hour. How to say what to say? Now, you learn this lesson. In that hour, the Spirit of God will speak in and through you. You tell them to the, my, the class, who oh, are very worried what to say, how to say. They, they can't learn this in class. They will learn it in actual. Right? See, I see all those nodding their head. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. You know, the rest, you don't know what's happening. Because, you, you know, it, you, haven't, you haven't seen this. You haven't experienced this. You think preaching is so easy. Teaching is so easy. I can do it. It's about... Speaking to the crowd, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, our greatest concern is whether the Spirit of God will speak in and through you. And that is what they got to learn. Wow, that is something. That really is something. With conviction, with confidence, with understanding of the Scriptures, they will now teach that the Holy Spirit promise will speak to them. That's what they needed to learn. Okay? Now, we're going to go fast forward to the book of Acts because three years of training goes by very fast, right? They, they were not confident. They were not all lots of things. They learned many challenging lessons. They were corrected. They were rebuked. They, all, all those things, right? Okay, what was three years like? <laughs> okay, faith struggle, normal. Okay, what, what did they go through? Well, what did they go through? Not all just struggle. They witnessed the mighty works of God through Jesus. They did. They had the opportunity to be involved in ministry. So I involved my discipleship class here. This is called, I said to them this morning, here's your opportunity to be involved in ministry. That they may learn. Okay. What did the disciples learn in three years? They saw the need. Jesus said, look, the harvest is white. Laborers are few. They were pushed to grow in their faith. That was what training is meant to see them to. You, you see this? Now, we come to the book of Acts, and this is important. Let's turn to the book of Acts chapter 1, and then we read. Acts is a continuation Right? And Acts stands for uh, two things. I want, you know, maybe we can, this is a fun way of remembering. Okay? Acts stands for actual. <laughs> you want to see it in actual practice? This is what the book of Acts was about. 
See, Jesus has already taught them much. Acts 1, the former account I made, right? And then all that Jesus began to do to teach, teach his disciple, showed them how it's done, right? Now, until the day which Jesus, he was taken up through the Holy Spirit, given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the idea of chosen, way back when I called you, disciple, chose you. Commission you, chose you. Now, the word here is chosen. The word call and chosen are very closely related, actually. Is to handpick you, is to select you out of. Okay? Not just in concept. The book of Acts is useful because you're going to see actual, actual life and ministry. Watch them. Did they? Jesus taught them. Jesus told them, wait for the Spirit of God that will come upon you. Told them in verse 8, you shall receive power when the Spirit of God come upon you. Now watch this. What were they doing? Tell them to wait. Now watch what they did in actual. Okay? They prayed. See, do we actually pray? Do we actually come? We say we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, we believe in prayer, and then we don't pray. This is not actual. This is called your theory. Theoretical faith is useless. You actually pray? Watch this. They, verse 14, they continued with one accord. They came together in prayer. Do you come together in prayer? One accord, with one heart, with the purpose, you know, we're coming together to pray. Do you come to pray? Or you come, yeah, I, I, I want to see, see who's here. I come to eat. I come to see people. I come because my parents come. I come because I've got nowhere to go. They came together, one accord, prayer, actual. Do you actually pray? That's why I use the word actual. Look at this, one, prayer. And then they continued in prayer. Supplication means they didn't just pray once. And then we see Verse 15, those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Together, the number of them was 120. And they said, men, brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled. And the Holy Spirit spoke in the mouth of David. You know what they were doing? They were organizing themselves. Judas betrayed Jesus. He killed himself. Now, 11 and you know what they were doing? They were reading the scriptures. They were praying. They were going to choose another person that will take the place of Judas. So when Jesus chose 12, it stays at 12. Do you see what they were doing? In actual, you come together, you organize this, you read the scriptures, you actually doing things together as people who are disciples. Do you actually do this? Do you actually serve? Do you actually come together? No, no actual or talk. You see, this is what chosen must be seen in actual real life. Now, here we go. Take a look at this. And so in chapter 2, did the Spirit of God fill them? Now, look at this. The day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all in one accord. You're going to see this verse again and again throughout the book of Acts. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, right? And then mighty winds and so on and so forth. This is a really special uh, ex uh, event that was taking place. An experience appeared to them, divided tongue like a fire. So you know, we can't even imagine what this was. And one sat upon each one. They were literally on fire for the Lord. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? Utterance means they could speak in a language. What were they saying? And in verse uh, 11, the Cretans, like, watch what they were saying. Okay? People were listening to them. Verse 8. 
How is it that we hear each one language, our own language, which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Judea, all those things. What we were. Many, many people gathered there, right? Visitors from Rome, okay? And then we read in verse 11, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. You are on fire for the Lord. The Spirit of God comes upon you. You are able to speak of the works of God with people. Otherwise, you'll be shy. You don't really speak of God very much. They spoke and even you, I mean, this is a miracle. They could speak in a language they've never learned just to affirm this is truly of the Spirit of God for this special occasion right here. Okay, so when people say, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I speak in a language, nobody knows. Uh, that is not from the Holy Spirit. From what spirit? I don't know. You're going to Holy Spirit? This is, this is the actual one. Right? And it's wonderful. Principle. They spoke the works of God. Actual. Do, so do we actually talk about God? Do we actually talk to people about the works of God? Do we actually see our heart and our mind filled with the Spirit of God again and again, zealous to speak, zealous to minister, zealous to share with people for the gospel? If there's no actual, maybe you don't even, maybe, you know, the problem, I would check my salvation. You've got to see the actual. You see actual? Acts. What Jesus taught, what Jesus said, how he would train. Now you're going to see it in actual life and ministry. Okay? Now, take a look at this very carefully. The book of Acts, we call them the Acts of the Apostle. You will see them in action. Action. Right? You see them. Peter, verse 14. When he, well, people who didn't understand what was going on, some were mocking. They're probably drunk. Peter stood up and then said and raised his voice, not shouting at people, and then he preached about Jesus. He bore witness from the Scriptures, answering from the Scriptures what's happening, and then bringing it home with the Gospel, and we see 3,000 souls convicted coming to faith in Christ. Wow. The word action is the word power. Do you have the ability? Jesus already said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is not Peter's own ability. The enabling comes from the, Lord, from the Spirit of God himself. You see them empowered. You see them enabled. You see the power of God in their life. You see the wisdom of God in their life. And this was the apostles. Ministry was challenging. Not just have 3,000 people win them to Christ. What do you do with them? You know what they did? They trained them. They made disciples. They continued in doctrine. They continued in fellowship. They continued. You cannot have evangelism, evangelism work without discipleship. You save people. What do you do with them? Oh, we keep on saving, saving. People, if they are saved, they don't grow. They can backslide. They can be prey for false doctrine. You see how church ministry is done right here in actual real life. This is the work of the Lord. And so they continued, they continued to be instructed, they continued to rejoice. The word is one accord. Look at that. Verse 46 is a beautiful description, continuing daily, one accord in the temple, breaking bread house to house, eat their food, gladness, simplicity of heart, praising God, favor with all people. The Lord added to the church, to those being saved. There you go. This is a growing church. Look at them. They're not just saved and become, uh, sit down there. Okay, now I'm a Christian. I sit down. I just sing some song. I eat my lunch. I go home. That's your understanding of salvation? That is not the Scripture's understanding. You are saved to be useful. 
You are saved that you, we may serve the Lord. You are among the chosen. And you are enabled. You see it as a joy. You see fellowship as a joy. You see coming together as a joy. You see worship as a joy. Prayer as a joy. You find favor with people and with God. And God adds to the church because you are enabled. You can care for people, right? If, if God adds 200 people to Bethel, we don't know what to do because very few are trained. You don't know what to do. May God not add. And he won't in his wisdom, in his mercy. Because if 200 come, we don't even know. We don't even know what to do now because Kapak is full. <laughs> We're looking for few people whom I can say, look, can I count on you? Can I uh, it, it entrust you to look after Kapak ministry? I already have a few in mind. I just have to talk to them. I've already spoken to two. Right? So wait to be chosen. Don't volunteer yourself, please. Okay, so, so this is important. But they can say no too, though. They can say, Pastor Chris, no. That's okay. Jesus called, follow. Can they say no? Yes, they can say no. But if you say, you know what? I've got a, what a privilege. I'm going to take it up. I'm going to see how my faith can be developed. Well, we're going to see something. Okay? Third word is not act, but actual application, third word. How do we apply this? We need to see application. They are apostles. How do it apply to us, non-apostles? Okay? Now, Acts 6 is very important because it will teach us how it actually applies to everyone else. Okay? You are an apostle? I'm not an apostle. There are apostles and then there are non-apostles. Can we still apply? The principles of the apostles must be learned. What can we follow in the footsteps with reference to the apostles? Acts 6, we read, in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplying. Now, you must first begin with, are you following Jesus or not? Disciple. If you are not even following Jesus, forget about serving the Lord. You will not be able you will not be enabled. The Spirit of God will not fill you at any way because you are not following Jesus. Okay? That's very clear. Word here is disciples. Now, there was a complaint that arose against the Hebrews, the Hellenists. There were problems here with, uh, you know, and there will always be problems. When they have so many people, sure got problem. Well, now, right now, we got a problem, but good problem. We got kapak problem. People parking all over the place. Okay, so I said to Uncle Henry, don't, don't worry, this is a good problem. Number one, please come earlier. <laughs> if you want to come late and still hope to have a good car park, yeah, not anymore. Gone are the days. Right? So it will make people, oh, you know, I better, okay, I better come earlier. Well, it's a good opportunity to develop a new ministry. Now, we are going to call and select people. What are we looking for? And this is what they did, okay? First, you must be a disciple. Second, the 12 summoned the multitude of disciples. And then he say, tells them, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So, sorry guys, I am not going to be kapak marshal and then later on go and preach. I have to know my role. You please, pastor, go pray, go and Read the Lord's Word. Study it. Be a man of God's Word. The pastor can't do everything, obviously. We cannot be caught up with, cannot do all the things. You think, never mind, pastor, superhuman. Super your head. <laughs> We're human. We can't do everything. The pastor can drop dead too. I've seen pastors in, uh, I have actually, actually seen that. They are in places where, because they, they got depressed. They are there because they are overworked. The church expects the pastor to do everything. Right? From preaching to washing to cooking to kappa to vacuuming the church to... Yeah, you know, what do we, why do we do this? Because you are the pastor, you do everything. Well, the church that does that just killed their own pastor. 
But of course, look at the wisdom here. He tells them, look, we will give ourselves to the word of God. We will give ourselves to prayer. We will train people. And he says to them, look at this. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men. Good reputation, number one. Do you have a good reputation? If your reputation is you got a short temper, if your reputation is your bad language, sorry, you cannot be chosen. Number two, full of the Holy Spirit. Number three, wisdom. First, this is why you need to be a disciple. These things, you've got to learn. You got, disciple is the starting point. You can start with nothing. And then you're chosen. Well, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to learn what it means to find wisdom from God through His Word. I'm going to seek the filling of the Spirit of God. Watch your own life change. You have a good reputation. And then choose them. These were the three criteria that was given and then that we may be a point over this business, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And this saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, Philip, right? And a list there, seven of them. And then they set them before the apostles. They prayed, they laid hands on them, and because they chose the right people, the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly, and many, many of them came to faith in Christ, including those who were priests. Do you see the pattern? Can we apply this? Chosen. In the mind, what does it mean to chosen? Actual. What does it mean to me in actual life and ministry? What about my actions? How do I apply this? Are we disciples? Are we following Jesus? When the time come, you are chosen, ready, able to serve the Lord as the church grows. But I don't want, I don't want to be, I don't want to be trained, I don't want to follow Jesus, I don't want to do all these things, I just want to do something. You cannot. You are going to make a mess out of it. This is not control. This is just doing it God's work. God's way. We must train people. We must equip people. They must be people that have wisdom. They must be people with understanding. And the church, everybody must know this. So I will uh, choose them and I'll show you who they are and we will give them a nice little, uh, make a little nice vest for them. These are your traffic marshal and you know, love them, cherish them. I will work closely with them. Okay? And so when they come, they, you're going to park your car, you, you smile. They tell you, please don't park here. You don't park there. <laughs> right? Otherwise, the pastor will come and see you too. So they are, you see, choose them, train them, commission them, give them authority, power is there. Okay, now, please park nicely. They will smile. They are gentle, right? Gentle. And then, please, and you say, I don't care, I want to park here. Okay, and then you, the next person you talk to is in the pastor's office. And you wouldn't want to do that. You see, our point is ministry. Is, see, this is in my heart. Why we want to do this is to really care for people. Let's park properly. Let's park in a way that we don't break the laws of the land. Two, we can park in a way we are considerate to everyone. We're going to do a car decal thing, so we're all registered. So we don't have to, well, whose car is this? You know, you know they are disabled parking. Please reserve them for those who need, need, need that. One is Auntie Kath over here. She's 99 years old and she worships with us. At least give her a special spot to park. Right? And so those who are in need. But if you are not in that kind of need, just because you came late, you want to park there, please don't do that. So if you see Uncle Henry say, could you please don't park here? Please listen to that word. Okay? Now, we want to reserve two parking right outside our doors. And these are for people uh, with a lot of children, a.k.a. Fun Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, your name is mentioned. Right? I don't know whether she's here this morning. Fun, are you here? 
no, 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 over the side. Okay, hyphen. You know, well, that's reserved for you, uh, dear, because, you know, we've got so many children and we understand Shang Wei, you know, need to go and all. Oh, sometimes you are like a single mother, not single mother. But she liked because husband is really got, a, you know, training to be a doctor and he has to go away for all the training. So let's, uh, you know, park closer to the, the place there. Now, if somebody is so ambitious, want to outdo Fun Fun in having more children, we can reserve another lot next to yours. Okay? But if you want to, we just want to care for those who are older. For example, if Auntie Mary, can we, we want, no, traffic marshals, help people, those who are older, park closer. Those of us fit like anything, it will be good for your spot tracker anyway, park further, you know, you walk a bit. Right? And then you don't want, people can be glad, you know, we're doing things sensibly, we're doing things wisely, we're doing things that could really be a blessing to heart. No, no need to argue. No need to fight. Right? And that will be a blessing. Now you understand why we want to do these things here? Because we find it here. Because this is what it means to be among the chosen. And we see the Lord is pleased with it. He will bless Wow, you can handle a full car park, huh? We add some more. Okay, rethink. <laughs> and some more, and some more. Don't ask for growth when you can't handle it. Well, let's see you being equipped further. Well, we've got young people being equipped. We've got older ones being equipped. Great. Some more. You want to be part of it? Be part of the Bethel family? You are welcome, but do it this way. First, be a disciple. First, for, first be saved. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then be a disciple. Then we see some fruits in your life. You will be trained, you'll be equipped, and then you will really be a blessing to, to people around you, to your church, to everywhere. Okay? Well, let's pray together. And may the Lord really encourage us to see this as possible, to see this in real life, to see this as actual, not theory, actual, action. Apply it into your own heart, into your own life. Okay? All right? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we bow our heads in prayer, thanking you to see growth in our church bit by bit. Now we have a full car park. Help us to develop and, and choose people carefully that we may see your work grow even more significantly. That the ministry of your word, that the ministry of prayer, two vital ministries that we see in the book of Acts will continue to be stronger, to continue to prosper and bless many lives. We ask that you would bless our hearts, even as we embark on this new, new ministry in a car park. May people come to know the Lord because of this ministry. May people's hearts be encouraged because of this too. And so we ask for your blessings upon us as we give an offering. May we give out of a deep love and joy and privilege of what it means to be chosen by you, to love you, to serve you as your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now here is a really wonderful song that must encourage our hearts as we read the book of Acts. What did they have when they first started out in the church? Hey, not much. If they had, they had nothing except their faith in Jesus, the word of God that Jesus taught them, the spirit of God that filled their heart, and look what they did. Let's find that same courage and strength and say, yes, we can do this too. This is the song. This is the spirit of this hymn. Rise up, O church of God. 293, if you're using the hymn note. This is a beautiful, stirring hymn, okay? So please don't make the author turn in his grave by singing it. <laughs> right? This is a stirring hymn. He wrote to encourage the church. Rise up, O church of God. They have done with lesser things. Give heart, mind, soul, strength to serve the kick of kicks. What a privilege. What a privilege to be chosen to serve the Lord. That is the one thing that just motivates and inspires us, that the Lord has chosen us. And that's it. And it keeps us going. That privilege chosen 
nobody, not the wisest, not, and yet God will pour in him, pour in the person and the people wisdom and strength that is from God, not from us. They've done with lesser things. We have more things than when the early church started in terms of things. But what they have, we must. Their faith in Jesus was real. They really believe in the word of God. They abide in it. They remained. They didn't drop out. And you watch them filled with the spirit of God. And that's what we can do too. Let's rise as we sing this hymn together. All four stanzas. Rise up, O church of God. Let this hymn speak to your heart deeply. How wonderful is to sing hymns of faith like this. I, re I really like that third stanza we just sang. Rise up, O sons of God. The church for you doth wait. He's waiting for you. What is a church? Look at that. Her strength, unequal to her ties, rise up. Make the church great. Brethren, make Bethel great. Can you do this? And let the Lord fill your heart with his spirit. Fill you with his word. Fill you with his power. Make that church great. And may the Lord's name be glorified. And we are part of it. What a privilege this is. Let's pray together. And now may this great God of ours, with divine power, unimaginable, the power that created the heavens and the earth, promise poured out into us mortal men. May we believe with all our heart the power that is available to all who will believe, the power to make the church great to this God who has chosen us and given to us the privilege to serve him. May the Lord Jesus Christ and his grace enable us to serve faithfully, to continue to follow the Lord Jesus as his disciple, that the spirit of God may fill our hearts, our mind, our very being, that we may truly be servants of his outstanding bringing glory, honor to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, whose name we honor and give praise and glory forevermore. Amen.